No is a powerful word. It's the word that kind of helps us to set boundaries. It's the word that protects us. It's the word that keeps us safe. Yes, however, that's a little more dangerous. That's a word that invites us into the unfamiliar, uh, that for which we are not fully trained, that which we did not imagine we would do or were capable of doing. Yes is the adventure that when balanced with all of our no's is a real invitation. And I wonder if that's a little bit of the Abraham story today. A story about the invitation found in saying yes. Not a story about the perfection found in saying yes, because Abraham makes quite a few errors, but the ways he is somehow guided by the single yes to Yahweh God. Now, Abraham is a part of the larger Genesis narrative, which is a part of the larger narrative of Israel. And if you recall, this text is written long after the events have occurred, and they're written with the intent of bringing a people who have been disjointed from culture and faith and their nation because of exile back together. Now, if you were reading through Genesis chapter 1 through 12, you would see that all is not well. Sin is a problem, murder has happened, humans move in ways that go against their created intention. And the dream of the Garden of Eden is collapsing. There are all of these small vignettes that tell the story of Israel along the way and pose the question, is there any hope? Now, you can imagine after 70 years in exile, so being taken from your homeland, so 70 years in exile, that this question, is there hope, would be one that is essential. Is there hope after we've lost connection with God, our land and our history and our future? Is there hope now that we found ourselves more connected to the ways of Babylon than the ways of Yahweh? Is there hope as we return to a land that is both ours and foreign all at once? Is there hope when we are disconnected from who we were? And the picture of Abraham seems to offer this whisper of hope when Abraham chose to say yes to the invitation that God offers him and his family and the soon-to-be nation of Israel. A hope that echoes through the centuries, even to those marching from exile. Now, the Abraham story begins with this acknowledgement that Abraham doesn't begin his journey in or from their home. Instead, it begins in an area very similar to the Babylon that Israel would have found themselves in during exile. And so for those coming out of exile, it would be this hopeful picture that Abraham's story begins with idol worship, a lack of knowledge about Yahweh, a no connection to the land that is promised. Yet when Abraham encounters this God who is previously unknown to him, yet he chooses to say yes. And for those looking for that glimmer of hope, here it is. God shows up for Abraham despite Abraham's history, despite his background, despite his homeland, and his own deep dive into a life and a world that did not move in the direction of who God is. And so for those leaving exile, for those whose stories mirror that of their patriarch, this is hopeful good news. But the good news is not simply intended to be this reflection of Abraham's invitation to become the father of a nation. Their hope should not simply rest in their ancestors and what their ancestors gained for them. The reading of Genesis should also remind those leaving exile that this story is equally about how this great nation would only achieve its greatness when who they were also created this positive impact and invitation to all of its surrounding neighbors. Indeed, Abraham's yes to God was intended to result in the creation of a yes for all people and for all nations. But there seems to be a bit of a problem. If Abraham is the father of a nation, then he needs to have a child. And when your first yes to God is in your 70s, it seems like childbearing just might be an impossibility. And so him and Sarah wait. They wait and wait, and God continues to make promises to them in dramatic fashion, 
but a promise made and a promise kept are not the same thing. And so Sarah and Abraham decide to take matters into their own hands. Thus emerges the tragic story of Hagar, their servant. Hagar is summoned by the ones who own her, Abraham and Sarah. She's impregnated, gives birth, and is then subsequently abused and belittled because she has simply followed orders. And in the end, it's revealed that her son is not the promised one. And while Hagar, the foreigner, will be discarded and forgotten by Abraham and by Sarah, she and her son will not be forgotten by God. This is an echo of the promise that the blessing is for all people. A reminder of all the ways Israel as a nation had and would disregard and discard their call to be a blessing to the masses. Yet despite the ease with which Israel abandons those they insist are foreigners, the story of Hagar hidden in the story of Abraham is equally this reminder of all the ways God would long for those called his people to both lean into and offer this original blessing that was intended to be good news for all. But if Hagar and Ishmael were not the answer to the promise made, then who was promised? Then what was God doing? Then when would God act? In the waiting, in what one may call Abraham's exile, he finds himself doubtful. Did this God that he heard actually speak, actually promise, actually call him to be the father of a nation? And it's at 99 that God responds to the questions that linger in Abraham's heart as Yahweh says, I am faithful, show yourself faithful. This is the beginning of the practice of circumcision for the Israelite people. While the nations that surrounded them had used circumcision as a mark of puberty or a rite of passage for the Israelites, this was to be a sign and a mark of belonging. But it became so much so a sign that it becomes their justification for Israel to define who's in and who's out, to justify their rejection of the call to be a blessing for all. Circumcision was intended to be this outward symbol of an inner devotion that would become the very thing that they stumble over, even when they find themselves in exile. And you see them continue to stumble even when you read into the New Testament. But the story of Abraham doesn't end with this circumcision as a sign of devotion. Abraham is also invited into this relationship where his commitment to God will result in a new way of living. One that in Genesis is noted as righteousness, but would easily be referred to or explained as following the Mosaic law. That's how the original writers and the original readers would have intended there's a little bit of a problem here. The problem is that at this point in the narrative that they're writing about, the law of Moses isn't established. Moses still won't be born for centuries to come. But we have to remember that this ancient text is written with purpose. It's written to guide a people back home, to walk a people back to the foundations of their faith. So the authors are not writing a falsehood into the text. Instead, they're shaping this narrative that invites those leaving exile to recognize that to follow Abraham is to follow the law, which is to follow Yahweh, their God. So they can find their way home by following the thread that the story of Abraham lays before them. The blessing of Abraham is also their blessing. And for those who were the original listeners, their blessing was tied both to return of the land, but also a return to the law, which became synonymous with a return to Yahweh, God. Now, this isn't always a perfect trajectory, but it would have been deeply meaningful as these ancient people attempt to communicate and reconcile what it means to belong to Yahweh and what it means to proclaim Yahweh, their God, as a people tied to Abraham's blessing, the father of a great nation, blessed to be a blessing. And here it is. As Abraham is circumcised, thereby being identified as belonging to God and committing himself in advance to the law of Moses, that the promise made then becomes the promise kept. And Isaac is born. 
And the message would have been clear to the former exiles who are finding their way home. Their existence as a people is linked to the God who fulfilled an impossible promise. The birth of Isaac to the childless and the barren and this elderly couple, Abraham and Sarah. But this was a promise that could only be fulfilled because Abraham said yes, despite all of the reasons he should have said no. All of the reasons that he should have no longer embraced hope. All of the reasons he should have simply returned and gone back to the place that was familiar and comfortable and the places that had become home to him. And so for all of those reasons, that those leaving exile, they also should have said no. They too should have let go of hope. They too should have simply returned to the place that was familiar, the place that was comfortable, the place that was called home. And the writers of Genesis choose to urge and prompt even those leaving Babylon behind to live as though saying yes to where God is leading, saying yes to where God is going, even when it involves leaning into the uncertainty of waiting, the belief in the impossible, and a step into and towards the unknown is always worth it for what God is building and what God is doing. But do we still believe that today? So I wonder, that if those in exile could somehow find a connection to the story of Abraham, if we too could kind of find a glimmer of hope or a picture of wisdom, that in our own wilderness, that in our own Babylon, that in our own moments of holding on to idols and ideas and ways that seem and are contrary to what God is like, if we too, even there, might hear the invitation to be a blessing. I wonder if right there, we too might hear the invitation to co-create greatness, to lean into our own identity as ones who are noted to be very good, to live lives that insist flourishing and blessing and greatness cannot be true if only for me and mine, but can become reality if they are declared as truth and as goodness for all people. I wonder if in our day and if in our time, if this ancient story still echoes an invitation that we just might be inclined to say yes to, regardless of where we are starting from. Yes, even when we can't see. Yes, even when we're uncertain, even when the impossible is before us. Yes, to the invitation to go where God is leading, to build where God is building, to co-create right where we are and right where we are asked to be. And so what are some of the things we might send God calling us to say yes to? Perhaps yes to a more just world. Perhaps yes to a more inclusive and diverse church. Perhaps yes to language that insists hope is even for those who might find themselves in hopeless situations. Perhaps a yes to liberation and freedom for all people. Perhaps yes to salvation as an opportunity even for those who resist it. Yes to goodness for those who do not choose goodness. Yes to redemption. Yes to the gospel. Yes, to the message of Jesus being such that it becomes a blessing for all people and not just for some. Yes, to where God is leading. Yes, to what God is building. Yes, to the message of God revealed to us in Christ. We have a saying that's used in church circles, and I think I say it often. Shalom. All will be made new. The blessing we have been giving. The hope we hold. The invitation we carry all proclaim this as our good news. But will we say yes to living out this declaration in such a way that the world around us knows that it's as much for them as it is for us? All people will be blessed through you. These words were forgotten over and over by Abraham. They were forgotten over and over again by Israel, by the early church, the ancient church, and even now the modern church. But in this moment, in this day and age, in this time of, of, of life, we are given this opportunity. 
we are given the invitation to say yes and to offer that yes to all people. What a blessing it is for us to be able to gather together, to be able to sing together, to worship together, to be able to hear the, the word read and to be able to pray together. And as we go into this week, I invite you to look around and to listen um, and to pay attention for where it is that you are invited to say yes. Where are you invited to say yes to creating a more just world? Where are you invited to say yes to engaging more in your neighborhood? Where are you invited to say yes to working more closely or spending more time with your family? All of these things sometimes feel as though they are these secular things out in the world, yet each of them are holy. Each of them have a way for us to be connected with God and connected with others. May we live this week with these words in our minds. May we love God more and may we love others more as a result of it. Have a blessed week.